And we're watching this, if you can imagine, on a little teeny black and white television, the Tijuana racetrack, knowing that if she wins, we're going to have to collect a million dollars from suspected members of the cartel. Welcome to Points Taken, a podcast about sports and sports betting and the people that make them interesting. I'm Brant James. Today we're joined by Mark Paul. His book, The Greatest Gambling Story Ever Told, is a yarn of two railbird friends, a long-shot bet on a filly named Winning Colors to win the 1988 Kentucky Derby, and collecting their winnings from a Mexican cartel. Just tell me about um, your history growing up and uh, dabbling in in betting on things, and and then we can just go right on into uh, Winning Colors. It sounds like a super interesting story. Yeah, um, I, I started off being fascinating with horse racing, from the second I went to the races for the first time at probably about age 14 or 15. And the second I walked into the track, it was like I was home. (laughs) And I just absolutely loved it. It was like, um, you know, it was just the most beautiful place with the, the excitement and the horses and the color of all of the silks. And then, of course, the excitement of, you know, having a chance to to wager on your picks, and then um, I I kind of fell in with a fairly educated group of semi-professional type gamblers, people that won't you wouldn't necessarily think that would be attracted to horse racing. I found that there's a very big academic crowd that likes horse mm-hmm. racing. There, <clears throat> they're attracted to it by the you know the the mental uh, challenge of trying to you know reading a racing form and trying to decipher um, a mm-hmm. winner, and so I I got into it and really early I I started studying it and trying to learn how to handicap and pick winners and it's probably um um <clears throat> in racing back then. Um, like I started occasionally getting to go to the turf club, which was, uh, I had friends that were members of the turf club and then, and it sounds funny today, but you'd have to, you'd have to buy a turf club membership and you would have to wear a coat and tie and there was, um, you know, women in hats and, and beautiful girls and, and on a Saturday and you know, these would like to be in the, in the would be in the early late 60s early 70s um you know it was really an event and like on a saturday there could be 70,000 people at a big race like the San Diego Derby or, or the like I'm not even the triple crown races and so it was it was really exciting exciting time and kind of sophisticated in a way but at the same time I liked it because it also, I always also went down to the grandstand um, and, you know, hung out with the $2 betters that were betting, you know, with their uh, uh, welfare checks probably <laughs> occasionally, right? So I saw the whole world of it. And so from the time I was 15, 16 was huge because then we, we could get our driver's licenses and we would drive to the racetrack. The only problem is we weren't old enough to get in or okay. gamble. So we would actually, my uh, my buddy in the book, Dino, um, we would actually get dressed in like suits and ties and so we could look older like we were young business people so that we could be allowed to bet. <laughs> but but was a little different. We had, since we were at the $50 window, they, they probably said, well, how, how could a 16-year-old be mm-hmm. at the $50 window? <laughs> so, you know, so we just, we loved it. And then... Um, I had a few interesting adventures. Um, when I was 20, I took a year off and went sailing oh. uh, on a 44-foot sailboat. And <clears throat> when we would, we actually sailed to Panama, you know, where the, <laughs> where the ships go through the Panama Canal. And I got off, it's, I was 20 years old. I'm six foot three, blonde, blue-eyed Norwegian guy, and the only way I can get to the racetrack in Panama is alone because my friends won't go yeah. with me. Uh, and I'm I'm on a bus 
like a city bus. You can imagine how I stood out as a <laughs> towhead surfer looking yeah. guy at six foot three on a bus going to the Panama City racetrack. That was colorful. Yeah. Then we kept sailing. We went to Jamaica. Of course, I had to get off and take the bus. I think I took a cab there okay. <laughs> to the horse races in Jamaica. Again, there I am with, you know, definitely was not a local. <laughs> and then sailed up into the Florida Keys. And when I got there, at, they were running at uh, Hialeah. Mm -hmm. And I got to see spectacular bid oh, um, wow. prep prep for the uh, Triple Crown races. So I was into it at a young, young yeah, age. That's interesting. Now, did you mentioned Dino. Did you have, it seems like always, always someone has an uncle or someone that takes them. Did you? Um, yeah, so you, I think you, and I do think it, it's not a long book. It's only 162 mm -hmm. pages. Um, I didn't want it to be long. I wanted it to be a fun, fast read. Um, and yeah, there was a, uh, my uh, best friend in that book, Dino Mateo is not his true name, but um, he was a big buddy of mine, and I did a lot of adventures, but not the not the sailing adventures. Mm -hmm. with him. Okay, all right. Well, let's let's uh, get into the really interesting story about uh, winning colors. Uh, you know, uh, sure. you know, big bet Mexican cartel. I was reading the jacket or the you know the, the picture of the jacket online, yeah. and and uh, you had me. So uh, yeah, you know, you don't give <laughs> the whole story away. Let's you know. I know I, I never do. I. I, I I never do. Um, the <clears throat> so this buddy and I, Dino and I, we're now like thirty years old, and it's nineteen seventy-seven. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, excuse me, nineteen eighty-seven. Um, and <clears throat> we were going to the track. We were we had, we were now had turf club passes, and we would go to the races almost all the time. We were single, and that, we lived at the track. And there was this filly who was just brilliant named Winning Colors. And she was winning all the filly races by like eight lengths. And we're going, wow, this horse is amazing. And we look at Eugene and we hear an interview um, with Eugene Klein. Mr. Klein owned the filly. Mm -hmm. He actually owned at the time 300 elite racehorses. He was one of the, he was a billionaire. He was the former. He'd sold the Seattle Supersonics, mm -hmm. and then he he had recently sold uh, the San Diego Chargers pro football team. And, <clears throat> or he was in the process of selling it right about this time, and they asked him, I said, they said, you know, if you could win, Mr. Klein, if you could win the Super Bowl, because you own a football team, or you could win the Kentucky Derby, what would you take? He said, oh, man, I'd take the Derby. It's much harder. There's 26 pro football mm -hmm. teams, and one of them's going to win it. But there's 40,000 yearlings born every year. They can only win as a three-year-old. It's just so much harder I would take the Derby. And so we're thinking, wow, he wants to win the Derby. He has this filly. And then we hear that he's had two heart attacks. He's almost 70. And my buddy and I go, you know, his dream is to win the Derby. He has this elite filly. And Wayne Lucas was one of the few trainers who would put fillies against uh, males fairly commonly. Mm -hmm. So we go, hey, you know, let's make a bet on this future book. It's six months before the Derby. It's, and we're talking now, it's like December. Right? And we shop around, we find out that she's 12 to 1 in Las Vegas. And we're thinking, yeah, that wouldn't be bad. Man, we'll put some money, we'll go to Vegas. But my buddy says, let's see if we can get better odds. And he calls around, because we're in Los Angeles. He gets. He finds out from a friend of his that goes to Tijuana all the time to the racetrack at Agua Caliente. Finds out she's fifty to one in Agua Caliente at Tijuana racetrack. Hmm. So, oh my, fifty to one. So, right away we get. We say, oh, right, this is it. This is a bet of a lifetime. This is take a shot. Um, so the two of us drive down to Tijuana, which is <laughs> quite an adventure. <laughs> it's Tijuana was. A place sailors were afraid to go, right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy, right? Uh, yeah, um, we go down there, and we put five thousand dollars to win on her, about five thousand. Um, six months before the race, and locked in fifty to one. But you know, we're going all right. What are really the chances of us cashing this bet? A filly had only won the Derby twice in a hundred and fourteen years. 
and you know, even if she was good enough to get in the race, she's probably going to have to run against 19 other of the best colts in the world and have to be damn lucky to prevail mm -hmm. anywhere, right? But she keeps advancing. She keeps advancing, and she runs in the Santa Anita Derby, which is one of the major prep races a month before the Kentucky Derby. And this is an interesting thing, uh, Brent, about my book, is that a lot of women really, really like my mm -hmm. book be because they're rooting for this filly, a female, to win a world championship or the equivalent in the Kentucky mm -hmm. Derby. And she's finally going to go against boys for the first time, and we know that she has to win this race or they're not going to, you know, if she can't beat, win the Santa Anita Derby, they're not going to ship her all the way to Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So they, they put her in the, the Santa Anita Derby, which would be run, by the way, this Saturday if it wasn't postponed. Um, and she wins by nine and a half lengths. Wow. And women are there, and they're holding signs, and everybody's behind this filly, and now now she's really gaining notoriety and steam, right? And <clears throat> so we start, now there's a month before the race, and we go, wow, this horse is, could be one of the favorites in the derby. This actually could happen. This could really happen. And we go, well, and then we start hearing rumors because we're talking to our buddies at the track, and they're going, dude, you're never going to collect. So what are you talking about? They're saying, uh, Agua Caliente is, they had just um, started live simulcasting work for the first time. You couldn't bet from home, but you could go to Churchill Downs and bet Santa Anita, and mm -hmm. you could go to Santa Anita, and you could bet on the Kentucky Derby. And so people that used to go to Agua Caliente to bet on all of the horses could now, didn't have to drive across the border, they could go down to Del Mar and bet the Hollywood Park and Keeneland races, for instance. So they were getting killed. Everybody's saying that track's going out of business. They ceased live horse racing for the most part. Occasionally they had a few races. And then we start reading deep where we go, uh-oh, we find out that the racetrack is owned um, by a suspected, and I want to say suspected because he's never been convicted, yes. okay? Yes. Um, suspected member of the cartel. And this is all footnoted in the biography. Everything I'm telling you is factual and it's very carefully documented yeah. in in the biography because, a bibliography rather, because, you know, I don't make accusations yeah. <laughs> on people yeah. like this that I can't back up. Um, yeah, we go. Oh, great! So then there's this there's there's this really famous um, writer in Tijuana by the name of that he went by the pen name of El Gato, the mm -hmm. cat. His name was Felix Miranda, I believe. It's, I have to look it up again. Um, and he's writing. He's a, the most famous journalist in all of northern Mexico, and he writes a column called A Little Something. And it's kind of like a Dear Abby column, but he covers all of the entertainment people, the wealthy people, the parties, the prize fights, you know, all the top things. And he's a really big author down there, a big uh, journalist. And he starts writing negative articles about the owner of the racetrack in Tijuana where we've made our bet. And a month before the race, he writes a negative article, and his offices are machine gun. Oh. His newspaper office, broad daylight. We're going, Jesus Christ! The guy writes a bad article about him, and he tries to kill him. What's it? What's it going to do to a couple of stupid gringos who've got to go down and collect money, right? So I run into another guy at the track, um, by the name of Big Bernie. It was his nickname. And Big Bernie had recently won a pick six, and he he'd won like a two hundred thousand dollar pick six. He was a much much bigger gambler and a lot more flush than we were. And I find out he's also made a much bigger bet than us um, on winning colors six months before the race to win the Kentucky Derby. So we kind of start teaming up with him and sharing data and information, and the journalist writes another negative article about the owner of the racetrack 
two weeks before the Kentucky Derby, and he is murdered, the journalist, in broad daylight. He's shotgunned to wow. death. Wow. And they arrest the owner, pardon me, the, the, the owner of the racetrack, they arrest his personal bodyguard, and they arrest the head of the racetrack security. Hmm. So now we're going, oh, this is great, right? So now even if our horse wins, we're going to have to try to go to the, we have over a million dollars of potential cashing. <laughs> you know, we didn't bet a million, but we were getting 50 to 1, right? So we had a million dollars in, in potential cashing, but we're realizing that even if our horse wins, we got to go down to friggin' Tijuana and try to collect a million dollars. And mine was, you know, mine was much less. My five thousand, we were collecting two hundred and fifty thousand yeah. plus yeah. or minus. But still, that's a lot of money in nineteen eighty-eight. <laughs> and it's a lot of money to collect. A lot of money to collect at a foreign racetrack in the middle of Tijuana. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so you know, the the plot kind of thickens here, and so. Winning Colors gets into the Derby. She's ridden by Gary Stevens, who is, you know, one of the greatest jockeys that's ever lived, Hall of Famer. She's trained by D. Wayne Lucas, the world famous, the Bob Baffert of his day. The two most famous trainers of all time are D. Wayne Lucas and Bob Baffert. Um, and we actually decide we need to be at the track the day of the race because we want to get paid on the spot, we're thinking, well, at least on Kentucky Derby Day, there'll be like, I don't know, 10,000 yeah. people at the racetrack. I really don't want to, I don't want to go down on a Tuesday and collect, you know, a million dollars, right? Okay. With the three of us. So we go to the track and here's where it gets interesting. Um, I don't, my, everybody knows that winning colors wins the Derby. And by the way, it was a photo, a photo finish. You could tell she'd won, yeah. but it was, it was, if you get a chance, go to YouTube and watch mm-hmm. the race. And imagine you're stand. Imagine, imagine, Brad, that you're. You have a million dollars to collect on this filly. She opens up in the top of the stretch by six and a half mm-hmm. lengths, and then one of the favorites, Forty Nine er, comes charging at her, and it, you just know he's going to nail her at the end. You can just. Yeah, because that was winning colors tempo was to to go out fast as i recall yeah. yeah she was she had more speed she was like almost i hate to say it like ruffian mm-hmm. but she she just never had been headed in a race and she was just blazing early speed so she opens up and then it's a desperate photo and we're watching this if you can imagine on a little teeny black and white <laughs> television the tijuana racetrack knowing that if she wins, we're going to have to collect a million dollars from suspected members of the cartel. Yeah. So you're like, we won, we won, and, eh, we won. Yeah, and uh, so the more exciting, so the funny thing is almost the more exciting part of the story is not just like a Disney story where the horse wins and everybody lives happily ever after, is what happens to us, that's the part, I'll stop uh-huh. now, where... What happens to these guys and the adventures that they have going forward trying to collect their Interesting. Money? Well, I'm confident that you made it out of there, um, unless something really weird happened. That's what everybody says. Everybody says, well, did you get the money? And I go, you got to exactly. read Exactly. But I don't. I have no idea where the other guy is, so I'll, you know, we can leave that a mystery. But uh, speaking of which, I was, I was checking it out. As of the recording of this, um, you're number one Amazon uh, on the Amazon list uh, for sports gambling books. Congratulations on that. I'm proud to say that it's number one in horse racing, which is not too difficult to do, <laughs> unfortunately. I'm number one in sports gambling. I've been as high as number one in all gambling books. It kind of you know goes up and down. Um, and I'm also I've been as high as number one in six other categories. So the book is shockingly <laughs> to me because I didn't write it really for commercial purposes, but it's been doing tremendously well and it's continuing to to do better and better every week um and then another interesting story um you know you you heard about me because of that press release yes. right well you might the press release is kind of funny in a way right because i talk about a, all the new 
the new gambling movies that are out, <laughs> but then here's the gambling book. Well, the, within five weeks of me writing the book, and mind you, I'm a first-time author. It does help probably that I live in Beverly Hills and my neighbors are in the, <laughs> are in the business, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, but um, it got optioned for a, a, ser- a possible series oh. or movie, probably a series. Within me, within five weeks of me writing the book, and a, almost a year before it was actually published. Oh. Oh, who's who would produce? Would it be you know Netflix or? I I, I don't really want to. I don't know. In right now, nothing's getting produced. Everybody's yeah. you know sit, sitting hunkered down. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, no, good for you. I'd say by the fireplace, but it's L.A., so we're probably sitting by the pool. Exactly. But... <laughs> Whatever works. Everyone must adjust so, their climate. Yeah. So I'm really hopeful. I think it would be fantastic if it could become um you know a series or a movie i think it'd be good for horse racing yeah it well, just definitely has a lot of juice there a lot of plot twists um, it sounds you know pretty compelling now you mentioned you didn't write this you know for commercial purposes it, it was just a great story that you wanted to have down in print i mean what what was your motivation i've had this story well you know I was an English major at UCLA, so <laughs> and I've always liked writing, right? And I've had this story in me for so long. Um, I held off of it for a number of reasons. One is fear of the owners of the racetrack. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, I kind of got to the point where now where I'm semi-retired and I had some time. And so, you know, obviously I want it to be a success. I'm saying that I'm a horse racing fan, um, and that's really the reason I wrote it, because I I love the sport. Um, I really spent a lot of time in the book talking about, like, the horse's groom and the backstretch people, because they're really the heroes. Horse racing gets so much bad press, and it's, in so many ways, it's just so misplaced, because the the people in the sport love horses. They take care of horses, and you know, a few bad apples. And but God, it's, you know, it's such a it's such a great, beautiful sport. I mention one last thing. Um, so I I wrote the book, and I'm sure you can relate to this as a as a writer. I wrote the book. Took me nine months, let's say, and I submitted it to. Um, uh, a guy who's a big Hollywood guy with a CAA agent and a big, big knowledgeable guy, and I gave it to him. And he came back and said, what do you think? He says, well, you know, if you're writing a book for gamblers, you did a great job. And he says, but you you missed the whole point. You missed the whole story. That's what he's talking about. He says, the story is about a female winning a world championship. In what In what sport... Because we were just talking about how not to make it just gambling specific brand, hmm. but this is really true. He says, he says, in what sport can a woman, a female at least, not a woman, but a female, compete head to head with a male? You're not going to have a female quarterback beat Tom Brady in the Super Bowl. You're you're not going to have somebody you know beat you know Kobe Bryant in a basketball game. But by God, you can have a female racehorse go out and win the world's greatest race. He says, you you write this book about a female beating the the boys and the male chauvinist pigs that were, said she couldn't do it. And and now you'll have a story about, um, a story that people will want to read everywhere uh, in, you know, in foreign countries. And by the way, my book is selling pretty well in in the UK already, because there's a lot of horse racing fans there. Um, yeah, and he says, you know, you need to develop your female characters better because women will love this story if, he said, what you need to do is make the horse the son in the in the story, and then all the other characters and stories revolve around the heroine, which is the filly. And so now, so I had to go back and I rewrote it. It took me about five, six months to rewrite it. And when I was done, all of a sudden, I had women that liked it. I even put 
it's some true, I, you know, it's a true story. Um, there's even some romance in it, and I had to work on female characters, which was it, that's the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. I would write it. I would write a female character and have my wife read it, and I would say, "Isn't this great?" And she says, "That is so stupid. A woman would never say that." You know, you know, that's not the way they would think. That's not the way they would. So that was the hardest thing that I ever did. <laughs> was try to write female characters. Do you uh, do you think? I mean, we we talked about sports betting, you know, spreading slowly across the country. We're almost at half of of the states now that have legalized it, and not necessarily all implemented it. But do you think sports betting can help? I don't know, save horse racing. It, it may need saving, but, but make it more mainstream and more re- relevant again, other than the, the Derby and the and then maybe the Preakness and then maybe the Belmont if there's a Triple Crown chance, as far as mainstream viewers, fans, sports fans? The answer is overall no. I think horse racing has a significant, major, major problem on its hands in that horse racing it's mostly, I mean, if, when I, I'm 63, when I go to the track, I'm the youngest guy there, right? Um, it, they, they're going to have so much competition from for young people to be able to gamble on sports. And they're going to gamble in sports in ways that we don't, you and I probably don't think of. They're going to be able to bet on, you know, is Tom Brady going to get a first down on this on this series, right? You know, lies. And when you bet on sports, there's either either you know team A wins or team B wins. So you're cashing 50% of the time, and you're only paying 5% commission. 10% when you lose, zero when you win. You know, on a 50-50 proposition. So horse racing with a 20% vigorous or commission rate on average, some bets are much higher, mm-hmm. it, good, it just grinds out its fans. And then there's other problems such as if young people have to download the form. Like, are you, you going to go out and buy a $5 racing form online or get a past performance chart yeah. in order to make a $20 bet or a $10 bet? And everybody has an opinion on a basketball game or a football game. It doesn't take much, but racing, you, know, you have to download the form and be knowledgeable. Mm-hmm. So I think horse racing is in a world of hurt um, going forward if they don't change the way they do things. They need to give free past performances, and they need to lower their commission rates dramatically. And so... On the other hand, I don't want to be doom and gloom. I think that there will be crossover, and I think that big, big races and big racetracks mm-hmm. um, can can thrive. Look at the way they do it, uh, like in Hong Kong, Shatin. Um, they only race there. I, I, I'm no expert there. I believe they race only on the weekends there, and they have huge pools and huge, um, you know, amount of, amount of money wagered. Um, so I think that like the Kentucky Derby and the Triple Crown races and the big races of the year, the Breeders' Cup, can do really, 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 really well. Um, however, I think that the days of having lots of little racetracks, small racetracks, are are over. I think we're going to have probably just you know a major racetrack in the West Coast and then a major racetrack in the Kentucky area and on a major racetrack in Florida and a major racetrack in New York. And I just don't, I don't see, I don't see how, how they're going to be able to survive having too many small racetracks because the, it's going to have to be an event and it will be online. And it already is. I mean, what I think about 80, 85% of the betting handle is typically bet online now. Wait till everybody in the world has online accounts and bets on their mobile devices. Yeah, very true. Very true. It's definitely skewing that way, too. I, I was thinking, what a great time for you to have this book out from just the topics you touched. The, the Derby should be coming up. <laughs> it's going to be September now, and sports betting is is sprouting all over. And it, it, it's 
still going to be a big thing, you know, once COVID-19 is, you know, hopefully soon in, in our past and we're all set. But you just have sort of to maybe wait a while for the payoff on, on more or, or maybe folks are sitting around and they're just they've watched every single thing on Netflix that they could possibly watch. And maybe it's a great time to, to read your book. But uh, it, it seems like, as you said, you sort of captured this confluence of, of, of two things, two really uh, interesting trends at the same time. It's interesting to me, Brent, um, you know, I expect it to sell to the horse racing crowd. But, you know, my, my two biggest categories of book sales one I kind of expected a little, which is true crime, which is a really big category. Oh, yeah, a lot okay. of I sell a lot of people interested in true crime, but this is, you know, a little twist. But you know, it's got a true crime element to it. Uh, but the area and the other area that I sell my number one seller in books, which I didn't anticipate, is sports biographies. Hmm. And that's a tough category because I had to compete with all the Kobe Bryant books and the mm -hmm. Tom Brady books and, and the like. But I've frequently in the top twenty of all sports biographies sold in, on Amazon these days. Interesting. Well, people love a story. If you can put a good story out there in front of them, people have always and will eat that up. So that's good for you. Thank you. That was Mark Paul. I'm Brant James, and this was Points Taken. Thank you for listening.